welcome everybody to the Brunel Law School uh, International Public International Law International Public Law Seminar Series. Um, I would like to thank everybody. Uh, first and foremost, our um, lineup of remarkable speakers uh, and everyone else who's joined us. I'd like to thank Salon and Patricia for all the work they do setting up uh, and organizing these uh, seminars. Um, and um, I think that the best way of uh, going about this is just um, start introducing our speakers and then um, maybe we'll just have the speakers um, doing their presentation and then leave uh, questions to the end. And uh, I think that usually we sort of allow people to put their virtual hand up or they can type their uh, question in the, in the chat box. Um, so that's um, more or less how we usually do these events. So um, as I said, uh, welcome and thank you to our uh, guest speakers today. Um, and I think I'll just follow the order that, um, of the uh, invitation and sort of introduce uh, each of our speakers uh, individually. Um, uh, so we have Navraj Singh Gale, we have Itmar Man today speaking, Espi Dula, Sisi Katsani, and um, uh, last but not least, Jason Ruddell. Um, I'll introduce you properly um, uh, as uh, we go along. So I think, um, Navraj, um, if you'd like to start, I'll just briefly introduce you. Uh, Navraj is a senior lecturer in climate law at uh, the Law School of um, Edinburgh University. I understand um, he was a barrister in his previous life in London and a lecturer at King's College. Um, he has carried out his study and research at the University of Cambridge, the European University Institute in Florence, and as a Fulbright Scholar at Berkeley. His primary research focus is on climate law, um, which uh, he approaches from an interdisciplinary perspective. And um, his research interest spans across different regulatory regimes, uh, geographical areas, regions, institutions, and uh, technologies. Uh, and just to mention just a few of his uh, current and forthcoming research projects, um, which include the inter interdisciplinary project on greenhouse gas removal technologies, oil and gas transition, and legal tools to decarbonize export credit agencies. His publications uh, with leading journals and publishers reflect his interdisciplinary approach to climate change and uh, range from climate change and industrial and energy transitions, uh, the Paris agreements on climate change, climate constitutionalism in the UK Supreme Court, uh, as well as climate change and labor law and um, just transitions for workers in the context of uh, climate change. So uh, it is my great pleasure to leave the floor to Navraj. Um, and as I said, we'll probably take questions at, at the end. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Isabel. That was a very kind introduction and uh, thank you uh, to uh, Solon and Patricia for the invitation and for organizing today's event. Uh, all right then, so uh, thank you very much all of you for uh, attending. <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about today really builds um, on a paper which uh, Alan Boyle and I wrote uh, called Climate Change and International Law Beyond the UNFCCC and this was published in the Oxford Handbook of International Climate Change Law. It was published a few years ago, so it's published just before Paris, actually. Uh, so in, uh, uh, 20, well, it was written in 2015, published in 2016. Um, and I want to say 
very little about that paper. What I really want to focus on is a current piece of work, um, which is uh, a little bit more practice uh, and campaigning oriented, uh, and it relates to the last of those projects which uh, Isabel introduced to do with export credit agencies. So, uh, the first, setting up the traditional problem. Okay, so the traditional problem uh, around uh, climate change and public international law. Um, I suppose this can be framed or sliced and diced in any number of ways. The way we sliced and diced it was to start off with the uh, UNFCCC and to articulate some of the very well-known shortcomings of the UNFCCC regime. And fundamentally, actually, the Paris Agreement made very little difference to those shortcomings. Uh, much that was uh, deficient about the prior regime continues to be uh, deficient about the present regime. The question then shifts to what are the alternative um, uh, fora uh, uh, you know, that uh, public international law may avail itself of, um, whether they are legislative or uh, uh, judicial fora. And we went through the list of the UN General Assembly, followed by the Security Council, Human Rights Council, the scope for human rights litigation. Uh, EIAs and integrating uh, climate change into EIAs more rigorously, uh, the use of uh, UNCLOS and the ITLOS tribunal, trade law, advisory opinions of the ICJ, and all of these are well-known alternatives, which, and, and many of them in the last six years have been um, explored much more fully in particular, for example, let's say the advisory opinion route, which is generating a lot of interest currently. Um, I should say, I should have said at the beginning, one of the things I do is that I advise a, well, the world's largest funder of climate change litigation. Um, so I see a lot of cases or potential cases that are looking for funding. And we fund a lot, a huge amount, um, you know, extraordinary sums of money. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things, of course, that uh, one uh, infers from this is that, um, Litigation is not the answer. Uh, litigation um, uh, was, and that was one of the conclusions of our paper, uh, that litigation was not the answer, that the important lesson and I'm quoting here is that climate change should be on the negotiating agenda of all international institutions whose mandate is affected by it. Climate change is too serious a problem to be left to the UNFCCC alone. Um, but it's also the case that there's a, um, and, and this is really a personal view, that there is an extremely constrained capacity for litigation to make an intrusive system changing difference to the climate change problematic. Mm. So uh, that's the first part of it. That's the, you know, and that's the sort of traditional terrain, I think, in which a lot of uh, climate change, public international law, um, uh, discourse revolves or operates within those four corners. Okay, so I want to say something rather different, and that's to give you a worked example of a current uh, project. Um, and it revolves around export credit agencies. Export credit agencies may be something that you know about, but I very much doubt it. They're an extremely discreet um, operator um, that very few people, uh, whether public international lawyers, or indeed people in finance, much less government, know a great deal about. This um, is a problem from a climate change perspective because export credit agencies are vast, absolutely enormous funders of um, climate change inducing infrastructure globally. Uh, on a per annum basis, it, and it's difficult to know the exact figures because there are all sorts of transparency issues. But uh, you know, at the OECD, at least, we're talking around 40 billion a year. You could probably multiply that, possibly not by an order of magnitude, but certainly by two or three, um, if you were to take in uh, China in particular, which is building out the Belt of Road for your Sinosur, which is its export credit agency. Um, and others. So, you know, we're talking about hundreds of billions of um, Paris non-aligned infrastructure, which is being built out every year and has been built out every year for decades um, via export credit agencies. So a lot of uh, 
action in the ECA world or in the um, ECA climate world has been around coal. And to some extent, I think there's a very good story to tell about coal. A great deal of um, uh, progress has been made, um, partly through um, constraints on domestic coal consumption, such as in the UK, where the, you know, this is what's really made the difference to the UK's um, uh, emissions profile um, through the carbon price floor, uh, uh, the ceiling rather. Um, EU, so some other EU member states have very well developed plans, um, although still are not coal free, and multilateral efforts such as the Power and Pass Coal Alliance. And as we saw in Glasgow 10 weeks ago, the uh, COP26 made some very um, important limitations on um, fi finance for uh, coal infrastructure. The big gap though, is oil and gas. Oil and gas is almost entirely unconstrained in terms of its um, uh, financing, its uh, ECA financing. Um, and as the IEA and Ekins and McLeod and many others have indicated, there is no scope for any new um, uh, fossil fuel infrastructure within a one and a half degree, any of the one and a half degree models. You know, that world just doesn't exist. That ship has sailed. So uh, how do we bring attention to, how, how has the issue of ECA's um, uh, come to light? Partly it was through a very bold and interesting uh, committee, uh, the uh, Environmental Audit Committee's report into ECAs from 2019, extremely powerful piece of work, powerful in the sense that it, it caused the United Kingdom to uh, essentially swear off all uh, fossil fuel finance as a matter of policy, uh, as a direct consequence of that um, uh, report, which I was involved in, I should say. Um, and far more important than that because of course we know that the United Kingdom whatever it historically has been is currently a minor player in these debates um, did manage to um, uh, pull together a commitment at COP and I think this is overwhelmingly the most important thing that happened at COP although it got no traction in the media um, was uh, a widely endorsed commitment to align international public support to the clean energy transition and out of unabated fossil fuels. And this commitment was signed by the United States, by most of the European Union, not all though, um, uh, a large number of Global South actors, um, IFIs and so on. So progress is being made. What's the legal regime relevant to ECAs? Um, I wonder if somebody knows, you can, you can tap it in the, um, you can tap it in the uh, chat or you could put your hand up. Anybody know who regulates ECAs? Uh, not at the national level, at the multilateral level. It's an OECD arrangement. It's an OECD agreement. So there are, there's um, the OECD arrangement on officially ex uh, supported export credits. Um, and this has long, you know, the, and it's long been the position actually that the OECD trade acquis is the global specialized regime for official export credits, um, not the WTO. So, you know, it's an it's a interesting little carve out from the WTO regime. Um, and at its heart is the arrangement, as it's called. Um, and the arrangement has been uh, around for decades. It's regularly updated. Um, updated most recently last year. And then there are the thing, there's something called the common approaches. And the common approaches are a, um, an effort. So these are all soft law instruments, I should say. The um, common approaches are a soft law instrument to promote coherence between OECD member countries' export policies and their environmental, social, and human rights commitments under a range of international agreements. What follows from that is that there are a range of sector understandings. So there's a sector understanding, for example, for coal, um, but there isn't one for oil and gas. And so what a uh, group of um, philanthropies and environmental uh, NGOs uh, and academics, of which I'm one, have been doing for a number of years is trying to you know, shift the debate uh, out of 
So not not the coal debate because that's the coal debate has been there's been a lot of work being done on that for a long time, and as I said, it's bearing very significant fruit. Part, uh, partly as a function of um, uh, sorry, that's my ten minutes up. Uh, partly as a function of um, uh, the market, but also for other reasons. Um, so the the new um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the the new uh, frontier really is oil and gas and the development of an oil and gas sector understanding, uh, which raises the question of what does a, a what what's the well it raises a number of questions for for lawyers right I mean the first is is this the appropriate fora um, or forum. Um, uh, I would uh, argue that it is for a number of reasons which we can go into if we wish. Um, secondly, um, is a soft law instrument um, an appropriate instrument um, as the others have been? So you know, there's a wide range of um, instruments within the uh, OECD's trade ECI. They're all soft law instruments. Um, highly, uh, you, can, you can debate their effectiveness, but broadly speaking, they are effective tools. Um, their limitations come not from their legal character, but rather their substantive um, uh, negotiated uh, limitations. Um, and how is it that one uh, introduces a sector understanding, which is essentially a, uh, an embargo or a moratorium on a particular activity uh, in a uh, sector as politically powerful and central to some economies as oil and gas. So um, I can, I, I'm aware that um, I'm against time, but there are basically three models which uh, are under discussion here. The first model is um, one which is very much framed within the terms of the uh, COP26 statement on international public support for the clean energy transition. That's one. The second, um, and this is sort of my favorite, is a um, CCS focused instrument. So this is an instrument which it's like a technology standard. Um, so it has a requirement and the requirements, the three requirements. One, the oil, oil and gas extractive activities have to account for their full scope three emissions um, associated with that extraction. Secondly, that those emissions are matched by equal and permanent sequestration of CO2 with full monitoring and storage. So this is essentially something which is called the carbon take back obligation. So amongst physicists and economists at the moment, the carbon take back obligation, so Miles Allen at Oxford and Stuart Hazeldean, my colleague at Edinburgh, plus others. This is one of the um, ideas that is being floated to uh, combat the oil and gas sector. And then thirdly, a life cycle intensity, uh, life cycle, life cycle carbon intensity target of the sort that you see in California. For those of you who are Calif know something about Californian energy law, um, where you map the up, mid, downstream emissions of um, any extractive activity and then ratchet them down over time. So those are the three basic models. Right, sorry, I'm very sorry that I'm over time, but I will stop there for you. Sorry, Isabel. Thank you very much, Raj. I'm sure we will all have many questions about ECAs. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll just move on to our next speaker. Um, and I'll just again briefly introduce um, uh, Itma Mann, uh, uh, who's a senior lecturer at the University of Haifa, uh, Faculty of Law. Uh, welcome, Itma. Uh, and uh, his uh, teaching and research interests are as well in public international law, uh, political theory, human rights, uh, migration, refugee law and environmental law, and the intersection between these different areas of um, public international law. Um, before moving to Haifa, he was the National Security Law Fellow and adjunct professor at Georgetown Law Center. Uh, he holds an LLB from Tel Aviv University and an LLM and JSD degrees from Yale School. Uh, he's the author of uh, uh, the book Humanity at Sea, Maritime Migration and the Foundations of International Law, uh, published with Cambridge University Press. And um, 
uh, his various um, um, publications on uh, international uh, journals um, on, again, migration and the um, migration and um, uh, intersection with other areas of international law, such as international criminal law, human rights law. Um, Itamar is also, I gather, um, uh, not only a legal scholar, but also an activist, and he's involved with, um, as a legal advisor for um, NGOs uh, that um, look at and investigate um, so-called migration pushback um, and in the Mediterranean Sea. And um, he's also given TED Talks um, as a scholar and activist on uh, the subject. Um, I hope I'm doing justice to <laughs> my speaker. Uh, that's uh, terrific. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. <laughs> and, and I'll leave it to you. And the kind introduction. Uh, thanks also to um, Salon and Patricia for the invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you uh, tonight, as you understood, or tonight over here, I should say. Um, as you may have understood from the brief introduction, I'm not primarily a climate law scholar. And so my uh, comments here today will be um, much um, on the intersection between what is happening in the climate space and uh, in the migration and refugee law space. And essentially, I want to propose to you a, a, a thesis that I've, I'm working on, but that hasn't been uh, published as of yet, um, on what's going on um, in this particular moment in time in these two spaces when taken together. And I want to call it um, the contemporary chiasma, chiasma, an X sign. Um, I'll, I'll be uh, clear about what that means in a second. Let, let, let me take you back as a starter, um, 10 weeks back, as uh, um, Navraj uh, indicated, I think, to Glasgow, uh, when um, the parties were um, sitting in the COP26 uh, and uh, reaching um, certain achievements. Some people were uh, uh, celebrated these achievements. Others thought that um, there, there's not much to celebrate at all. But um, what I want to really shed a light on is that at the same time, when they were sitting there around November uh, 12, November 10th, 12, the last days of COP, um, we at this, uh, there, there were about 2,000 asylum seekers, migrants, and refugees caught in borderlands between uh, uh, Poland and Belarus, and really on the Be Belarusian side of the border after um, they had uh, attempted crossings in the previous months. And um, I think that taking these two moments together and thinking, uh, you know, what um, is happening in each of them might teach us something important and interesting on uh, the contemporary moment. Um, think of uh, the same day, November 12th, um, in Glasgow and on the Belarusian side, the cold border where, where people are being delivered. Um, emergency aid by IOM, by UNHCR, by the Belarusian uh, Red Cross um, in what seemed to be a very dramatic uh, moment in the uh, context of refugee and migration um, governance in Europe. So what, what, what is it that I'm, I'm talking about here? Uh, the juxtaposition is um, what I suggested to you as this chiasma or this X sign. I think there is a transformation on each side of um, the scene that I set for you, but the transformation on each side goes in a different direction. And um, the, the, the directionality is along a continuum of the solidification or on the other hand, uh, the, the dissolution of a, customary, a fundamental customary international law norm. Let's start with, with the Glasgow context. Um, as we have heard from the previous uh, speaker, um, and I'm, I'm taking Glasgow as a, as a point in time along a larger continuum within a context of a number of years of development in the climate sphere. And as we have heard here, the ha there has been considerable uh, progress specifically in the context of energy, uh, of coal-based energy. And um, 
what what we have seen in Glasgow is, um, I think, the culmination of a process that we can start to think about in terms of the solidification of a customary international law uh, norm against uh, limitless CO2 or carbon emissions. So I'm, I'm putting this intentionally in very um, meager, light terms. I said limitless in order not to overstate or suggest that there's more happening than really um, is happening. And also I want to limit it geographically to some extent. I, I don't claim that this is a global um, process, but I do think that if we look at um, pre uh, uh, recent decisions, the celebrated um, Amsterdam District Court decision against Shell that foreshadows Article 17 of the Glasgow Pact and also builds on previous, uh, on the Paris Agreement, of course, in terms of um, reducing the, the, the Shell obligations to reduce global carbon dioxide emissions by 45 percent um, until 2030. We take that alongside um, the October um, Human Rights Council um, declaration that there is indeed now um, an, uh, a right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. We also look a little bit to the United States with a recent decision, decision from just a few days ago, striking down um, uh, oil and gas uh, leases by a federal judge in Washington, D.C. And we take all of these together, as I said, with Article 17 of the Glasgow Pact that uh, provides that uh, limiting, limiting global warming to one and a half uh, Celsius requires rapid, deep, and sustained reductions in global greenhouse gas emissions, including reducing global, global carbon dioxide emissions by 45% by 2030 relative to 2010 levels and to net zero around mid-century. All this is, I think, quite um, familiar to the people sitting here, perhaps. Um, all this together signals that there is a directionality. All I need for my, my argument here is a certain directionality in terms of the uh, emergence of a certain customary rule. I'm not, I'm not trying to state anything more than that. Now I'm moving um, to the other part of the scene that I uh, set for you to the Belarus-Polish uh, border. And I think, and, and, and this I say with a, with a heavy heart as someone as um, Isabel has indicated in the beginning, who has also engaged in activism and advocacy in this context, I, I want to say with a heavy heart that over the last few years, and once again, Belarus is a culmination of these years, we have seen um, something that seems to be a certain relaxation and perhaps even dissolution and, and, and collapse of the customary international law norm against refoulement in uh, Western uh, industrialist, industrialized democracies. I take you to September, a little bit before uh, the moment I just started my talk from when the European Court of Human Rights um, provides Rule 39 um, interim measures against the pushbacks on the Belarusian, uh, on the Polish, uh, Latvian and Lithuanian uh, borders with Belarus, and these uh, are not um, fully complied with. This is, of course, not entirely new, but when taken in the context of developments in Greece, where pushbacks have become systematic in the Aegean Sea, as well as in the Evros region, and once again, I want to bring in the United States with Title 42, which is a um, uh, provision that Trump started to use during the pandemic in order to push back people on the US-Mexican border and Biden is now defending in the US uh, judiciary system. Alongside certain developments with regard to Malta, in particular in the Mid-Mediterranean and to a lesser extent Italy, all these um, seem to be on the fault lines between global north and global uh, south countries. And in all these contexts, there is really um, a kind of collapse of basic fundamental norms. And I'm not the first one to notice this. Of course, um, others, other commentators, Nick Tan and Daniel Guzelbash, for example, have published a paper on whether the pandemic has brought the end of uh, the, the rule of uh, non-reformal. 
So we see on the one hand a certain rise and solidification of a certain minimal norm that maybe will not be enough. I mean, I, I should say pr probably will not be enough to meet the challenges we face in any significant way, but still is something. And on the other hand, we see a collapse of the norm and um, its eradication. So what do we learn from this dual uh, reality in which we are now uh, living? And so I think one hypothesis is if, if we will see a continuation along this pattern is to talk about what um, the Indian novelist uh, and author Amitav Ghosh um, has mentioned uh, in terms of the armed gunboat politics. So in, uh, if I try to summarize the idea here, it is that it, within the context of a climate catastrophe, of an impending climate catastrophe, um, countries that will have the opportunity to do so will be behaving like gunboats in the sense that they will try to survive and they will perceive any other uh, inter uh, intervention, in this case, asylum seekers, refugees, this is something that he writes about as well, as a kind of threat that will be shot down in an armed way, basically in terms of conflict. Um, that uh, there is a kind of um, migration conflict that emerges from uh, the climate um, crisis that we live in. So that's the kind of pessimistic take on, on the duality that I've provided to you here. But perhaps, and here I must be very, very careful, there's also a different take uh, to make. And some of you may be familiar with, I'm not sure, but perhaps with a paper that caused some uh, celebration a few years ago by um, an academic, a US-based academic named Tendai Achiyume, who wrote about migration as decolonization. This was published, um, if I'm not correct, if I'm not wrong, in 2019 by the Stanford Law Review, Stanford Law Journal. Um, and she writes about um, how migrants and refugees, asylum seekers, are basically performing an act of decolonization by moving across uh, borders, by um, seeking to get remedies from countries that have historically colonized them. And here, I think there's an enormous risk. This is a, a basically a, a global revolutionary uh, vision that might also be part of a dynamic of an armed uh, gunboat that I just described a moment earlier. But if there is a solidification of a new norm in the climate context, perhaps we should be talking about more about migration as decarbonization. And here, I'm intentionally offering a kind of quip or um, I guess uh, paraphrase on Tendai's uh, felicitous uh, phrase in the sense that if we are to try still uh, to create new uh, collectively agreed upon norms that will allow protection for those who need it um, uh, across borders in, in the context of migration, that needs to be shoehorned and harnessed onto really the developments in the climate um, uh, space much more um, significantly than it has been before. How to do that is, is an enormously good question. People here will say there's already such, um, I think, fragile political will to do important, to take important steps in the climate context. You want to uh, weigh them, weigh that will with even more weight in such a fraught area as migration, you'll surely um, lead to even the minimal steps that have been taken being backtracked. So I, I, I'm not sure whether that's ne a necessary conclusion or not, but I want to offer that if there is still, if there is any opportunity in, in, in the world as we see it today um, to offer protection in a collectively agreed upon and, and treaty-based based way to migrants and, and asylum seekers in the con context of the climate crisis, it must be um, recontextualized very seriously um, in, in the relevant uh, instruments that are emerging. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isama. Thank you. Um, so I'll.
Uh, now I invite um, to speak Sissi uh, Cazzoni. She uh, joins us, I guess, from uh, the uh, University of Bochum. She's a research associate and PhD student at the Institute for International Law and Peace and Armed Conflict at Bochum. Um, she holds an LLB from the University of Athens uh, and an LM from the University of Athens and the University of Groningen. Her publication uh, interests and uh, her uh, research interests are in public international law, theory of international law, refugee law and international human rights law. And um, Sisi as well um, is interested in the intersection between different areas uh, um, of in, uh, public international law, such as international human rights law, refugee law and climate law. Um, she has uh, written uh, widely on um, issues such as uh, the evolution of non refoulement uh, just to keep uh, with what uh, Itamar was saying, uh, uh, from negative to positive obligations. Um, she has uh, written on um, human rights and uh, re the Refugee Convention and uh, the future of climate refugees in uh, international uh, law. So um, I'll leave uh, the floor uh, to Sissy, who I believe is here. Um, and if, yes, okay, so I'll- Thank you very the... much. Welcome. Thank you for the introduction uh, and of course for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I am having some uh, issues with the internet connection. Hopefully that will not um, affect the presentation. Uh, but yes, as, as uh, you mentioned earlier, I would like to, to send you my presentation today on the main sources of protection for those often referred to as, as climate refugees, or to be more precise, to those whose displacement um, is linked uh, to, for, to reasons relating to climate change and disasters. Um, indeed, it has been reiterated in academic writings that it doesn't make much sense to say that someone is, <clears throat> excuse me, displaced by climate change, but it rather makes more sense to say that the impacts of disasters and climate change amplify pre-existing risks, which eventually lead to displacement. This was recently verified by the UNHCR in its legal considerations on protection uh, in the context of climate change and disasters, where it was underlined that climate change may disrupt the functioning of governments, which leads to the exacerbation of discrimination and marginalization, and may eventually lead um, uh, to the displacement as it amplifies the fear of persecution. Although this is the case, there is no international legal treaty aiming at uh, protecting precisely such displaced persons. There are regional documents like the Kampala Convention, uh, which um, targets uh, the protection of these, um, these uh, persons precisely. However, at an international level, such a treaty does not exist so far, a treaty akin to the Refugee uh, Convention, I mean. Um, and so, uh, given the narrow scope of the refugee definition in the Refugee Convention, not everyone whose displacement is linked uh, to, to climate change and disasters will be able to fit within such a narrow scope. And um, discussions have a reason as to whether this limited definition should be broadened so that climate change and related disasters are brought within the um, grounds of persecution. But such discussions have eventually led to even further um, considerations of what prioritizes uh, such, such grounds uh, over others, um, including extreme poverty. Um, and after all, the lack of political appetite, which was also mentioned earlier, um, shows that renegotiations might, um, might backfire and eventually lead to an even uh, narrower, um, narrower, narrower uh, refugee definition in the end. Um, in any case, the fact remains that most of those displaced for reasons relating to climate change uh, and disasters are and are expected to remain internally displaced 
in this sense, and considering that no cross-border movements take place, um, the role of international law in this context is limited. Um, there are, of course, human rights provisions uh, that set the standards of treatment for internally displaced persons and the guiding principles on, international, on internal displacement uh, constitute such an example of specialized um, document uh, attempting to set out the rights and obligations uh, afforded to and owed to uh, internally displaced persons. Um, but with regard to cross-border movements, uh, international human rights law plays a much bigger role, um, considering that in this context, and of course, uh, in the customary rule, uh, number of among rule stemming therefrom, um, the personal scope of a non refugee is much broader uh, than the one afforded by refugee convention. So um, we see that there is a, mar uh, a, a much larger, uh, sorry, uh, personal scope and a wider um, uh, range of uh, of. Uh, persons uh, benefiting therefrom. And we have already seen that, kind of, uh, in the Human Rights Committee's recent decision, the Titiota decision, which uh, precisely um, dealt with the issue of climate refugees, let's say. There, the committee acknowledged that the impacts of climate change can themselves constitute inhuman or degrading treatment, and that non-refinement provisions under human rights law require states to not return persons to countries where um, the impacts of climate, say, uh, climate change are uh, so intense that they may uh, cause life-threatening risks uh, to, the, um, to the persons remaining there. However, and even though in that uh, case, the Tiotta decision, um, the applicant's home country is going to vanish within the next 10 to 15 years, the Human Rights Committee uh, concluded that a real risk to Mr. Tiotta's right to life was not demonstrated, and therefore um, there was no need of international protection. I, I mean, the, the real risk threshold had not been met for him to be afforded international protection under the ICPR. Uh, what was particularly interesting, I guess, is the fact that the Human Rights Committee noted that within this uh, remaining 10 to 15 years, states can still mitigate the risks of climate change. So that was um, how it grounded its decision um, at, at, um, at a, um, a good uh, at a large extent. Uh, still, in his dissenting opinion, Ambassador Laki argued that this threshold should not be too high or is or it would become unreasonable. He further elaborated that it would be counterintuitive to the protection of life to wait until more deaths are uh, take place and uh, until deaths are more frequent in order to consider the threshold of risk as met. He even paralyzed the returns of those displaced for reasons relating to climate change to the return of a drowning person to a sinking vessel. And against this background, he, sense, he um, stressed that the facts before the committee re-emphasized the need to, to employ a human-sensitive approach to human rights issues. So this sentiment, which was um, elaborated in this, in his dissenting opinion, has also been reflected in, in academic writings. And Professor McAdam has noted, and I quote, that an unsatisfying but perhaps inevitable limitation to the Human Rights Committee's decision is its failure to provide guidance as to where the tipping point lies. Um, indeed, we didn't see when uh, we, we don't know how, when to expect that the real risk threshold will be deemed as having been met and therefore from which point on we can consider that climate refugees uh, should be protected under, um, should be considered as protected under human rights law. Um, and therefore this remains rather foggy. At any rate, human rights for have held, however, that under human rights law, states bear positive obligations requiring them to take positive measures to prevent displacement and to re relocate those adversely affected by climate change and disasters. Um, given this, this pronounced, such pronouncements, and of course, uh, considering the human rights rather pessimistic, uh, um, 
excuse me, uh, po uh, positive findings uh, in its, in its uh, recent decision, the TTOT decision, we can still see that uh, protection afforded um, to uh, those whose displacement is linked somehow to climate change as, as a class half full. Uh, so the protection afforded to them by international law could be seen as a class half full. On a much more positive note, however, and in a more regional context in Latin America, we can note that migration opportunities already exist, enabling such people to move either during the anticipation of climate change or in the aftermath of a disaster. And likewise, at the domestic level, some states have provided temporary protections and have waived visa requirements or have even included uh, concluded free movement um, agreements with other states in the aftermath of disasters, um, while others have even uh, developed guidelines con concerning plant relocation and internal displacement. In this sense, states seem to have proper mode of taking matters into their hands in order to accommodate climate-induced displacement. And indeed, it is particularly important that these uh, attempts are multiplied and that states already dealing with the consequences of climate change protect their citizens' human rights with the help, of course, of the international community. After all, the majority of, the state of um, those displaced for reasons relating to climate change are expected to remain within their country. So policymakers should not only focus on mitigating the risks of climate change, but also on implementing sensible long-term migration policies and plant relocation um, of uh, particularly vulnerable communities. And in this context, involving everyone um, affected by this, such measures in preparatory discussions is particularly important. So um, on that note, I would leave it to the next speaker and I will be open to discussion later if that is of interest, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ceci. Thank you very much for a lovely presentation. I'll move on to our next speaker, and then uh, I will open uh, the floor for any questions or uh, comments. So our next uh, distinguished distinguished speaker is Jason Raddle. Uh, he's an assistant professor of public international law at Leiden University. Uh, he was previously a lecturer on the LLM in international law at the Graduate Institute of International Development studies and a visiting professor of international law at the Université Catholique de Lille. Um, Dr. Raddle holds a PhD and master's in international law from the Graduate Institute uh, in Geneva and a law degree from Trinity College Dublin. Um, uh, Jason has published in uh, different areas of public international law like our previous speakers his uh, research uh, interest spans across international law, public international law, human rights, international environmental law, investment law, and legal theory. Um, Jason has also published with the Oxford University Press and Cambridge University Press. His, uh, one of his latest major works um, uh, is the book Altruism in International Law, published with Cambridge University Press and Compensation for Environmental Damage Under International Law, published with Routledge. He's also uh, written extensively in uh, international journals. Uh, one of his latest uh, articles is The Natural Remedy for Zoonotic Diseases, and uh, as well as the obligation to cooperate in the fight against uh, climate change. Um, Jason, too, uh, in addition to his academic activities, has worked with international organizations, NGOs, and law firms, and he is uh, in, being involved in uh, several investor state arbitration cases. So I'll just leave the floor to our last speaker, um, Jason, and uh, then we'll open up the floor to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel, and thank you to the organizers, Solon and Patricia and uh, Brunel University for uh, inviting me today. It's really a pleasure to be part of this uh, important panel. So I'd like to speak about uh, what international law 
can do to to mitigate the risk of zoonotic spillover uh, that is driven by climate change. And in the 10 minutes or so that I've got, I'll try to make sort of three main points. First, I'll try to give a bit of an explainer around how climate change drives zoonotic spillover. Uh, then I'll try to highlight some of the uh, weaknesses in environmental governance that we're currently facing. And then finally, I'll make a few brief suggestions as to reforms that could be, could be made. Um, so without further ado, just to illustrate the problem that we're facing a little, and I'll try not to mention the, the C word here, but uh, we all know it's the elephant in the, in the room. Um, most infectious diseases uh, in humans are zoonotic, which means that um, a virus or disease uh, comes from the natural uh, world, usually animals. And it's actually somewhat alarming um, to recall that uh, new infectious diseases emerge uh, approximately every four months. Um, so this is you know, a serious issue that we're, we're facing uh, as we are all uh, well aware at this, at this stage. And actually environmental changes are some of the principal factors that cause viruses to jump uh, from the natural world into, into human beings. And this is usually caused uh, by, by humans, by human activity, uh, land use changes, the destruction of, of biological uh, diversity, uh, but also human induced uh, climate change. And that's what I'll focus on today. Climate change uh, is, a, is a major factor in zoonotic spillover in, in a variety of ways, actually. So the survival, uh, reproduction, distribution of uh, pathogens, uh, of pathogen vectors, things that, um, that exacerbate the spread of, of pathogens, of pathogen hosts, are all influenced by climate uh, change. And things like warmer temperatures can really increase uh, the incidence of disease because this increases uh, vector population size and distribution um, and increases the, the duration of the season in which infect infectious uh, vector species are present in the environment. And so there's a, a number of ways in which climate change will exacerbate um, uh, zoonotic spillover and the presence of pathogens in the natural world. Um, in fact, the, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services uh, has fairly recently warned that climate change uh, substantially raises the risk of a future uh, pandemic uh, because of the new and increased contact between species. Um, species are different species are inevitably sort of forced to change their habitats, migration patterns, to live in more densely populated areas, to come into uh, closer contact with, with human beings um, as a result of climate change. And this, of course, facilitates the uh, pathogens jumping uh, more easily uh, between species. And also, uh, as we know, you know, climate change causes the loss of biodiversity and biodiversity lowers, or a loss of biodiversity lowers resistance to, to pathogens that are circling in the, in the natural world because genetic differences um, help to slow and, and stop the spread of pathogens uh, uh, that, are, that are circling. It's a natural uh, barrier. So little, that's a little bit of the problem. Um, one of the uh, ways in which we can uh, combat climate change, as, as we know, of course, is, is through various uh, 
instruments of, of, of international law, but it seems environmental governance has, uh, has failed. Um, and I'd like to give you a few uh, quick examples of uh, sort of specific weaknesses that, that, that I think uh, need to be addressed in the, in the climate change uh, framework. Um, I think to make a more general point, uh, climate change, environmental and animal health uh, and global health governance have, have generally been treated uh, as separate issues uh, in a rather fragmented uh, global governance uh, environment. And this really ignores their interdependent uh, nature uh, in, in the natural world. Um, but more specifically, um, there are significant weaknesses in, in the climate change framework itself. If we look, for example, at the UN Framework Convention on, on Climate Change, it recognizes in a very abstract way that adverse effects of climate change impact human health, um, but it doesn't explicitly address the role that climate change plays in driving zoonotic disease spillover, or it, it doesn't contain any binding obligations in, in this respect. And there's also inadequate integration of health factors in adaptation, mitigation, and, and, and other plans. And there's similarly inadequate availability of uh, funding for, for health and, and adaptation. Uh, and, and beyond the climate change uh, regime, uh, there are numerous weaknesses in, in sort of the, the core cornerstones, principles and rules of international environmental law uh, more generally and the way it uh, tackles climate change. We need only think, for example, of, of the no harm rule, uh, which will be well known to, to all of you, you know, the idea that states should not uh, cause harm to, to, to other states, you know, it only captures environmental damage that has an observable impact uh, across an international frontier um, into another state or beyond national jurisdiction. And this can really exclude from view um, profound damage to, to ecosystems, biodiversity, the importance of natural carbon sequestration um, from state responsibility. Uh, so I, I could point to many other examples, um, but uh, clearly there are some fundamental deficiencies in international environmental law and, and climate change uh, law uh, uh, more specifically. And so what to do? I'd like to try to suggest um, a few ideas for, for reform, and, and perhaps we can go into further detail later on in the Q&A. Um, so overall, I think you know, we need to connect climate change and global health governance in a more integrated way. Um, and I think the singular most significant way to address that disconnect between climate environment and human health would be through the adoption of a One Health uh, approach. This has been talked about a lot in, in policy circles um, and it certainly informs policy discussions, but I think we would do well to take it perhaps more seriously in uh, discussions around international law reform. Now, the One Health approach uh, has been defined uh, as the collaborative effort across multiple disciplines uh, to attain optimal health for peoples, animals, and the environments. And it can be a key tool for preventing and managing diseases occurring at the interface of human, animal, and environmental health. And there are already several sets of principles that seek to uh, elaborate the One Health uh, approach, the Berlin and the Manhattan uh, principles uh, in particular. And, you know, these really seek to, to secure ecosystem health, environmental health, uh, as well as deal with environmental challenges like climate change and antimicrobial resistance in the natural world from biodiversity and, and so on. So I think we need to take uh, these very seriously and to 
to implement them in, in practice. And then perhaps turning uh, to the climate change uh, regime itself, um, I think there are significant reforms that could be made. Of course, we need to dig in and, and reinforce the current efforts to, to tackle climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But I think there's uh, more specific actions that could be taken too in respect of zoonotic uh, spillover uh, and the risk that climate change presents. There needs to be a recognition, I think, of the, the connection between climate change and the emergence of zoonotic uh, disease. Um, and this could perhaps feature more prominently in the nationally determined contributions that, that states uh, make and will make under the Paris uh, Agreement and in other, other commitments uh, as well. I think there's, there's a lot that uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, regime could learn from, from other multilateral environmental agreements. Uh, so, for example, um, the Bonn Convention on Migratory Species or the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, uh, these specifically address um, aspects like wildlife health uh, and they provide binding uh, obligations um, that, that seek to address the, the root causes of zoonotic uh, spillover. And of course, within these conventional frameworks, um, there is uh, scope to develop resolutions, sub-agreements, uh, and we, we should seek to do this under the auspices uh, of the UNFCCC on human, animal, uh, and ecosystem health. If we look, for example, at uh, the Ramsar Convention, its resolution on wetlands and health, um, which seeks to adopt an, an ecosystems approach, I think is, is quite a good uh, example. It really requires parties uh, to consider ecological needs uh, along with more direct uh, and immediate uh, human interests. So parties to that agreement are specifically uh, called on to consider the impact of uh, human activities on, on zoonosis. Um, so I think the resolution is quite a good example of an integrated understanding of health in an environmental context. And similarly, there are resolutions under the, the Bonn Convention framework that represent uh, good practices to be, to be followed. Um, I think uh, the risk of zoonotic spillover should feature more prominently also in, in mitigation and adaptation uh, strategies to deal with the, the effects of, of climate change better surveillance mechanisms are needed to warn of the risks in specific um, hotspots. If we look, for example, to the agreement on the conservation of African Eurasian migratory water, bar, uh, water birds, uh, this is uh, quite an interesting model um, in which states uh, should develop national surveillance programs and risk assessment protocols that will minimize uh, transmission between animals and, and wildlife. And we can see all sorts of other disease monitoring um, in, in, in other countries, but there needs to be more of this. This needs to be uh, incentivized uh, more, more widely. Um, and also we need to think about yeah, adapting to um, yeah, the effects of, of, of climate change. Um, so for example, there's an interesting initiative uh, in, in France and I think the EU more, more widely um, that, that seeks to, to monitor uh, mosquito um, prevalence. I think it's called the Tiger Mosquito Surveillance uh, Network. You know, as the environment, the climate in, in France, uh, the EU more generally uh, becomes more favorable for, for mosquitoes. Um, of course, these are a, a huge disease vector uh, and need to be monitored, uh, surveilled, and uh, you know, ultimately uh, yeah, kept in, in, in check as the climate changes. Beyond the climate change regime, I think we need to think carefully about whether, and indeed how, uh, climate change might be addressed in any future pandemic treaty, uh, of which um, you know, is currently being considered in the context of the, the World Health Organization. 
Um, so environmental interests will need to be represented uh, uh, adequately, I think, in, in, in that context too. And then uh, beyond uh, those contexts, um, I think efforts may also be pursued in, in the human rights uh, fora as well. And as we know, environmental and climate uh, damage interfere with uh, the realization of you know, well-established human rights like uh, the right to life uh, or health uh, or the emerging uh, right to a healthy environment. Um, we've seen resolutions of the Human Rights Council and the Human Rights Committee on, on this, as well as uh, litigation, but I think we're all aware of the, the barriers and the challenges in, in those contexts as well, uh, which will need to be uh, addressed. So I think in conclusion, um, we need to really reevaluate our relationship with, with nature as we come out of this uh, pandemic. Um, our protection of the environment should really recognize that we are an essential part of nature. We're not above it. Uh, preventing climate change, um, the effective promotion of biodiversity, ecosystems, and the natural resilience of the environment needs to be central to, to regulatory efforts uh, going forward. And I think we need to remind each other, the wider world, um, that prevention is always better than cure, you know, even from an economic perspective, stopping the spread of uh, pathogens before they emerge from the natural world is, is much more, is much less costly than pandemics themselves. And uh, the World Bank has produced some very interesting uh, data on uh, just uh, how much value for money environmental interventions and environmental protection provide uh, uh, in contrast to the cost of pandemics. So perhaps I'll just finish by saying uh, coronavirus uh, and zoonotic diseases are a warning from nature. Coronavirus wasn't the first warning from uh, nature. There have been many uh, uh, zoonotic diseases in the past, uh, but it, it could well be the the last uh, if we uh, choose what we do next carefully. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you to all the uh, speakers for their very interesting and certainly for me very thought provoking uh, presentations. Um, I'll give uh, people in the audience some time to you know, think whether they want to put their hand up or they want to uh, write uh, a question in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I was just thinking, I just have a general question for all the, the, the speakers on the panel. Something that sort of comes up in, in all of your presentation um, is, you know, the urgency of what um, uh, climate change is um, uh, bringing to us. And, it, you know, the intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change has been uh, very, uh, very straightforward about, uh, about this and has, you know, uh, unequivocally said that we need changes and we need changes, uh, rapid changes and, um, really uh, far-reaching changes uh, in all aspects of our life uh, from energy for you know the way we go about our life communication etc um, urban design anything um, and all of that is regulated uh, by by law and so we all sort of try to think um, you know what needs to change uh, for in in our respective area or discipline, uh, in order to um, transition to a sustainable future, and um, I was wondering, um, one of the things that comes out of the presentation is that the public international public law is very fragmented in its approach to climate change. We have different approaches to different types of problems, whether it's the refugees, whether it's carbon emission, whether it's um, uh, zoonotic spillovers, uh, etc. So um, 
and one of the themes is that um, you know there are some fundamental rules are at stake. Um, fundamentals, whether it's the principle of non-refoulement or um, whether it's uh, the no harm rule, uh, whether the nature of the type of uh, treaties and obligations, soft law, hard law. Um, and so <laughs> it's a very sort of kind of big, broad question, but um, what do you think, you know, is public international law in this fragmentation? Does it mean that public international law is not fit for purpose? Is it is fragmentation actually something that might work, um, that might allow greater adaptability? Uh, is it something that um, uh, is a limit to uh, the changes that need to happen? We need to start thinking differently. We need to have you know legal sort of inject some legal imagination to deal with these problems and we don't really have much time i mean we talk about you know um, a couple of decades a few decades um so i just wanted to know your thoughts on on this if you do have any and then i'll leave it to others yes never yeah thanks um just make some quick remarks to get the conversation going. Um, in terms of avoiding one and a half degrees warming, you're right, we don't have time. Um, most scientists that I work with say that the budget will be blown by the end of this decade, if not the early, very early years of the next decade. So that's gone. One and a half degrees is gone. That's not going to happen. Um, and in terms of two degrees, I mean, that's really catastrophic stuff. So um, you know, that that's also an enormous challenge. And the way I normally describe this is that we need to have the emissions uh, profile, all of us around the world will have to have the emissions profile of a 15th century European peasant, but with no diminution in our welfare. You know, that's the challenge. Um, and in fact, a, a considerable increase in our welfare globally. Um, so, you know, that's, 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 that's tough. Um, we're finding it tough enough to maintain our welfare as it is actually. So that, that, that's the one issue. The second, I mean, on the small specific issue about fragmentation, I mean, you know, the, what Koskinemi was drawing attention to really was the risk of fragmentation in international law arising from competing mandates of international institutions. And, you know, we know that that's a very real risk. I suppose the, um, the optimistic analysis would be to say that what the climate regime for all its faults and its faults are myriad, but what the climate regime has done has been to articulate the nature of the physical science problem in uh, legal discourse, which then gives other uh, international institutions, that is international institutions out with the uh, UNFCCC, the opportunity to integrate those insights within their own negotiating agenda. So whether we're talking about trade or um, migration or um, other health related regimes, that that that's a real possibility to cut through the risk of you know, fragmentation in that classical sense. So that I don't actually view as a, um, an insuperable challenge. And you know, in those international regimes uh, or international institutions in which, I'm, uh, which I either track or which I'm engaged in, which would be a variety of trade regimes, international finance, um, yeah, stick to those ones. Um, and it is very much the case that that's exactly what is happening, notwithstanding their mandates, they are attempting in you know fairly serious ways to integrate um, the uh, insights of the Paris Agreement, however limited and inadequate they may be, into their work. So I don't think fragmentation is the primary risk. Thank you, Navaraj. Thank you very much. I don't know whether anyone else has any comments um, or whether there I, are. A... I have a brief question, if I can. 
cognizant yes, also of the time, of course. of course. We said till five o'clock. We are now past a bit five, but very brisk uh, question uh, to Sisi uh, Tamar, the junction between climate change and refugee law. And the question is, what about stateless people? We are talking about climate refugees as people who are moving because they face the danger, but what's happening when people become stateless because of climate change? So this is the question. If international law, if as international scholars, we should also look into this issue. Uh, so thanks, uh, Solon, for um, your question. Um, I think that the question um, really um, highlights that we need to kind of uh, rethink a migration from the bottom up when we think of climate change. We cannot really just, I, I don't think the, my, my feeling is that the orientation of um, adding a climate refugee category to the existing um, kind of refugee definition is um, not going to be one. It's not going to be. It's not going to work. And two, it's not going to be sufficient in terms of the scope of uh, the issue um, in um, the coming years. Maybe now, even. Um, and also, maybe I, I'll add that it's also very, very difficult to um, disentangle climate from other. Um, especially social economic um, reasons for migration. And statelessness in that regard is uh, really just another uh, part of a very large puzzle that needs to be re-scrambled and put together anew, as it were. Um, and that's, uh, you know, I, I, I although uh, Navraj left us with some measure of optimism regarding the challenge of fragmentation, most I, I really didn't mean to. I apologize if that's the impression <laughs> I gave. Uh, most, of, most of the time when I consider these problems, I, I, I see very, very slim possibilities that these challenges will be met in any effective uh, way. And I think it's much more probable as a descriptive matter um, that they will emerge into a very serious uh, conflicts and migration conflicts in particular, including with uh, perhaps with stateless populations, but really across the board of the displacement um, continuum. Uh, if there is any um, possibility to still kind of meet the challenge, at least in a partial way, um, then I think it's not through a redefinition of the refugee, but it's through, um, I mean, these attempts have been made uh, in the run-up to the Global Migration uh, Pact, but um, in possibilities of kind of uh, um, uh, you know, uh, labor migration in greater um, numbers, and um, the as as I tried to say, the integration of the migration problem in very deeply into uh, the specific terms of um, the climate challenge. Perhaps this does uh, resonate with some of Navranj's, uh comments from before reg other, regarding uh, perhaps other uh, regimes. I don't know if you can hear me, but perhaps I would also like to add to the sure. uh, the question that you also raised there earlier regarding the fragmentation and, of course, building on what uh, Itmar mentioned regarding uh, statelessness and uh, climate refugees. I just wanted to, climate refugees, I'm using that of myself, but anyway, I just wanted to to mention that I uh, I don't um, think that fragmentation is this that much evident here in the context of of uh, climate-induced migration because, um, well, I, 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 I did a, uh, a lot of research on this because like it was actually my, my second master's thesis, which eventually was published as an article in the Cambridge International Law Journal. And there I noted that um, I, I kind of compared the interpretations of various um, uh, uh, notions entailed in the refugee definition and in the interpretation of non refoulement and I noticed that whenever um, it was interpreted uh, and applied, um, either in the context of human rights law or uh, refugee law, um, we had the same interpretative outcomes, of course, when uh, that was the case when uh, 
the refugee uh, definition, the refugee definition or refugee of the non refugee norm under uh, the Refugee Convention was interpreted holistically, taking the uh, human rights law into account and vice versa. I just wanted to, to mention that so that I don't think that because I think that that's not actually the main problem when it comes to the protection of, of climate uh, induced migrants. So that's not something I just wanted to add. Thank you. I just want to say thank you very much again to our speakers uh, for their presentations, uh, for your time, uh, your expertise. Um, we're very, very uh, grateful. Uh, and thank you to all of you who joined us for the event uh, today. And again, thank you to Solon and Patricia. And maybe to add here briefly that we look forward to seeing you on February the 16th. We have the next event with the former Jordanian Prime Minister and former Vice President of the International Court of Justice, uh, on al Kassane, and we look forward to seeing you also then. And stay tuned also, we're going to post it in our page and in Facebook in the relevant group. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>